everyone. I'm Elise Adler, Director of Events for Parnassus Books. And I'm Ann Patchett, owner of Parnassus Books. And we are delighted to introduce and welcome you to the most fantastic event today, featuring Nina Stibby. And she's here to celebrate her incredible new book. You've read it. Yes, I have it. It's incredible. I loved it. One day I shall astonish the world. And by the way, it's today. Today is the day that Nina Stibby astonishes <laughs> the world, both with this book and with this incredible conversation that's about to happen with my pal Maria Semple. We have two of the smartest funniest women writing today in conversation. And I know them both and I love them both. They're fantastic writers, they're great people, but most importantly, they're just really funny and kind and they're here together. It's they, gonna be so good. They, I'm, I'm here because I wanna watch. And we're gonna watch and all of you are gonna watch and really love it and have a great time. But I would be remiss if I didn't say, remember you can buy oh, both of their books. Please do. Yeah, all yeah. of their books. Um, from from Parnassus. From Parnassus, yeah. So oh, wait, let me tell you what. Okay. <laughs> because this is how we buy kibble for Sparky, right? There you go. You buy the book and then you support the bookstore and the staff and we can feed the dog. Thank you. So very quickly, Nina is an award-winning author. She has two works of nonfiction, three previous novels. And we and she is brilliant and she's funny and she's here with us from way far across the pond. And she's in conversation, as Anne said, with fellow award-winning author Maria Stemple. And so let's just bring them on. I am thrilled to turn it over to Nina and Maria. Ask questions. Be sure and ask them questions. Yes. They will do their best to answer throughout the course you. of the conversation. Hey, Nina, it's so good to see you. Hey, lovely to see you too. Congratulations on this fantastic novel. Oh my gosh, I like like all your other writing, it just transports me to a, a kinder, happier place. You, and it's it's just so dense with comedy. It's, it's really kind of mind blowing. And I, you've you. done it again. Oh, you, thank you. You did the, the the you you did the full Nina Stibby again. It's 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 very exciting for us fans. I have the UK, um, the, the the UK version, um, mm -hmm. and the the one in the US is blue. Everybody, but it's just a wonderful book. Um, so boy, I I I'm very disappointed that you're not going to uh, spend the next hour reading your book because that's <laughs> all I want to hear is just your voice, like the oh, sorry. voice coming out of you. It's so wonderful. But but let's let's get to talk about this book um, in particular. I mean, it it's so kind of free and outlandish and like I say dense and and voicey and charming and it just goes where it wants and and like all your other books I would I was ready after the first paragraph just to go wherever you wanted to take me because it was just so wonderful and I'm wondering how you like do you structure these books I mean they just feel so free and loose and I'm wondering what your relationship is with story and wow. how, because you tell a great story, but it just doesn't feel like that's your concern in a sneaky yeah. way. And I'm wondering when you write, what what's going on? Well, I, I'm i not a good planner. I just, I, I find planning kills it for me. Mm. And I've, not with this book, with the previous book, I really tried to plan. And you know about screenwriting, but I sort of, I had a little go at screenwriting that didn't work out actually, but I liked the methods that my, cause you know, you do it collaboratively. Yes. And they were all talking about lists of happenings and having three sections and arcs. And, yeah. and so I thought, okay, I'm going to do it like that. Not for this book, but for the previous book. So I set it all out and it just, killed it for me i just couldn't do it it just took so long and i i kept saying don't think don't don't be creative i stopped myself being creative wow so what i did with this book is what i normally do which is i start with just a silly idea 
and I just I just let it go and this is why it, the, and so a, a reviewer once said that my books were just ambling digression and I thought well yeah it is a bit I, that's me but I mean, I, you know, I, I, I was about to get insulted in a way, but, but not, I think in the same way that you're maybe not that insulted yeah, because it's like, if it's a great ambling digression, but, but it's more than that. I mean, I, I do think these are real characters and you are telling real mm -hmm. stories mm -hmm. with real characters. So I, I think, I think there's more to it than that in real relationships, you know, that you can't just do an ambling digressions, but where, what, what did, did you start in the beginning? Like when you say you just had a weird idea, like was the weird idea kind of in the middle of the book or what, like, what was your weird idea? I guess is weird I for this one. I, I wanted to do what I thought was a really short period of time, which is a funny thing to say to you because your last book was one day, right, but I right. wanted it. I wanted an academic year. So from September to sort of June, and I wanted a backdrop of a university because I wanted a workplace novel. Um, I really loved that book uh, by Joshua Ferris um, about the office. Uh, yeah, was now it? we've come to the end. Yeah, yeah, I love that book. And I love the workplace. And I thought, let's get out of the home and get it get out. So I thought academic year, university, and I would follow the exact year week by week and i set it and i was going to have it from september 2019 to 2020 you know sort of middle of 2020 and i would and it was going to be the university's centenary year lots of celebrations happening in the late spring early summer and when i was writing it um well covid started happening so i thought well i'll go back I'll go back a year because I, I, you know, I can't, I, I didn't design these people to cope with, right. <laughs> with a global pandemic. And it's not fair on them that, you know, how is the university going to cope? And then I thought, actually, none of us would have designed for that. None of us. So they're going to have to go through it. And although it's not a huge part, the pandemic is not a huge part of this book. We go there. And I'm, I made that, I made them, I thought, yeah, they got to do it. Yeah. Well that, yeah, I mean, it was, it's interesting you say it because it is, I think in a way that, that does, did mimic life. It does come out of nowhere as, yeah. as it did. Yes. Yes. You know? yes. <laughs> so I mean, that, so, so much of the book is the planning for events that we know are never going to happen. Right. And then, so you're thinking, well, there's so much stress about particular events and yeah, I just played around with that. But so everything I'd planned just got pushed away. I didn't do, I didn't write the book I set to write, set out to write at all because of COVID. And so really because of the COVID, you feel like you started out like because the 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 book does cover such a, a huge span of time mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you do it so beautifully and okay. and i i believe it might have been ann patchett that referred to it as dickensian the skill with which you you can cover time that's and such so, a, oh that's such an amazing thing to say thank you yeah um, and, and, and you yeah and and how did that how how did that how did you decide to then cover I, so much time? I just, I, I didn't decide to do it. It's just the narrator kept flashing back. She ah. kept, so the, so the, the continual present is 2019, 2020, but she went back. She said, Oh, you know, this happened. And I just thought, well, I'm just going to let her dwell on all that. Right. And I sort of let that character, um, tell her story and i'm so old and i've got such a great memory that it's almost a waste not to and also it's it's sort of the flashback start in 1990 that doesn't feel that long ago to me you're the only person i've ever referred to i've ever heard refer to themselves as being old with a great memory yeah <laughs> i'm old my I, memory's I, going i'm just saying yeah it's it's scary how i can remember things and so yeah i I didn't mean to have quite so much flashback, but then it felt quite nice. And yeah, I just let her 
go back and and ramble yes and and so um what i'm wondering is that when when she just starts to ramble and that's where i think the you're at at your best because it is so chock full of the funniest weirdest shit that's just thrown away or some of them are longer you know it's a paragraph some of them are a sentence uh, just mm -hmm. funny things mm -hmm. and i'm wondering does that just happen in the moment when you're writing or do you have notebooks that you refer to or how how does it become so dense with just the craziest most fabulous throwaway funny stuff it, they pop into my head Mm. They, and less so with this book because it was fiction with my three previous novels literally things popped into my head and even I would laugh I'd type chuckling I'd go <laughs> with this one I had to work a little bit harder and I had to keep looping back and so I'd make a character play ping pong and then think oh that would be funny to mention that again now what, one of the things the thing I like about this book it, that was planned is that I wanted a, a woman of my age to want to talk a lot and everyone's shutting her down, shutting yes. her down, shutting her down. Husband's putting his fingers in his ears. Literally sitting there literally like Literally going like that. And she's, and then I wanted her to not give up and just keep talking. And she talks a lot about talking. There's lots of mentions of talking. And, and Grace, the stepdaughter, is just like, get her to stop talking. And, and first thing she ever says to her, can you stop talking? She's five years old. And she says, stop talking. And that comes back to haunt her later. Mm -hmm. And And her husband says to her when he gets, well, I won't do spoilers, but when he gets ill, he says, you know, you finally talked someone to death. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I actually, maybe this is a little too technical, but I actually found it very interesting how little dialogue is in the book. You know, when you like flip through the book, it's mm. not a lot of white space. Like I, well, I just, well, that was a list, the white space that just popped up. But I feel like in my books, there's all this white space because I do have a lot of dialogues, like I'm right in the scenes and I have a lot of dialogue and you manage to have this, I, I guess, it, it was it was a, a very talky person without a lot of dialogue and in in some ways we wouldn't even know that she was that talky you mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying if, if because if she's being she's being closed down so much of the time and she says she says that her husband denies her i can't remember how she quite puts it but she's denied the right to speak and that, that it that it started quite early and then by now he's putting his fingers in his ears and so she's talking to us yes so i would normally have more dialogue but she tries to speak to people and they just they just cut her off right so she's I, and, inside her head yeah and she's she's telling us and she's she says at one point, I need I need a long run up. If I want to tell you anything, I need a long run up. And I have to give the I have to give the background to this. And um, yeah, so she's and this is why I like I mean, I won't talk about the ending too much, but I like that she doesn't give up. Right. No, definitely. And 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 the and the beginning of the book is the letter that she's writing so it is her voice she's speaking yeah. and that's kind of what we what we come around to and almost learn the story of it right is yeah. that little preface yeah. of what the letter yeah. is and that is her like kind of claiming her voice now yeah. the, the the previous three novels were is it fair to say they were more autobiographical yes it's fair to say that okay good because some people get touchy about that i don't personally no, they're, but they're very much so yes right and so and so they're kind of a trilogy right would you say mm -hmm. like a, a yes, autobiographical yes. trilogy yeah and so and this doesn't fit into that and i'm wondering what what it was like to break free from lizzie and the trilogy and did you like it did you want to do it do you want to go back to lizzie or what was the experience the experience of writing fiction so this is my fourth novel, but the first that could really be called fiction. Oh, and you know, I really the the three previous novels are very autobiographical. I didn't have to, I I didn't have to make up any characters. The shape of the story was already there. It was it was easy. I'm, I hate to say it, this was 
so much more difficult and to try and find to try and plot without it being obvious i didn't i can't plan as i said earlier and so it was it was really much more difficult and yeah i i so i've built this world with these characters and i don't know how people how do you write a novel and then just leave it and not think i want to write more about those characters i mean i see little bits in your novels that you know there's a, there's a school that comes up again and there's right right yeah but i i i just think i've written this i want to write more about these characters mm. just because they exist for me now i don't want to give up on them yeah that's interesting because see i think that i probably i mean it, I, because people have asked me about, you know, sequels, but, but I feel like maybe it's the kind of story person I am that you might recognize from your bad stints with screenwriters is that I feel like I bring my characters to a point where they've kind of learned everything that they can learn and they're going to be okay. You know, okay. That, that, yeah. all my characters are okay at the end. And I feel like it's, you don't want to write a book about characters who are okay. You know, <laughs> I just feel like they're done. Yeah. They're, they've gone yeah, through yeah, the yeah. drama. And I always feel like I've, it's just like kind of putting them to bed and kissing their forehead goodnight and saying like, you're safe now, you know? And, and so, I, do you know, I think I've heard you say this. Mm -hmm. I think, this p putting them to bed and kissing them good night yeah i think i've heard you say that before or i've read it mm -hmm. and that does make sense to me but i don't yeah i don't think i'm done with lizzie yet partly because she's so much me but she kind of caught up with love nina she yes. we finished lizzie at the age of so whether i go back to her after then or i don't know i don't know but this this writing fiction is a tough game i don't know how you do it <laughs> it's it's it, it is it's it's very tough and i you know one of the things not to kind of overshare is that i i'm writing a novel and have been been struggling and one of the things that i'm struggling with is is um is about writing a novel like in this moment moment in time that's yeah. just the world's changing and and yeah. it's changing so fast and I don't really understand mm. my place in it do I have a place in it should I have a place in it you know I'm really kind of struggling with that on a deep level and I I was really in in heartened uh that you maintain your voice completely mm -hmm. like this is a nina stibby book absolutely yes. Yes. and yet you really grappled with contemporary issues and i'm wondering yeah. was that did you was it just did you just happen to or were you, did you put a lot of thought in it was it a struggle to figure out how i I want, I knew I had to do it. I couldn't write about now without touching on certain themes. Right. Uh, but I did worry and I still do worry that, um, somebody's going to come at me and say, <laughs> well, you know, you wrote that really insensitively or this happened and I wouldn't have written it like that. Um, I have a 22 year old daughter and a 19 year old son and so i would check with them with i'd say how do you feel how does this sound to you as a young person um so i did do quite a bit of checking um ah uh, i don't know it's it's scary it's sc i mean one of the one of the reasons i think that that my narrator goes back and right. keeps going back is so that i don't have to be now you know right. I mean, I've only just thought that. I just thought, yeah, actually, maybe that's why I dwell in the 90s for so long on, on the flashbacks. Well, I thought it was I, it was very inspiring to me to see that you did both. You know, you maintained well, thank what you, you I'm good. And, and, and you And you made it really, um, re, re, you know, feel feel really urgently kind of, of, of now. Now, I have a couple things. Um, okay, first of all, questions. Anyone have questions? Please put them in the chat and I'll ask Nina. So we love questions and, and yeah. I will ask them as we go or ask them at the end, but but anyone wants to uh, wants to type a question, let's go. So um, you wrote Man at the Helm before Love Nina was published. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So that's so okay. So so will you how tell me about that so 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 you, you was it man at the helm the one that i read or was it just a horrible 
draft of it that shouldn't have been published or was it the one that got published is essentially it was a different version it was the same story because it's my life you know it's a it's a chunk of memoir and i had written it in a very self-conscious way i think i tried to sound like maybe a little bit like edna o'brien which is ridiculous because i'm not irish or catholic right. and but i i was self-consciously trying to write like a writer mm. and uh it people a couple of agents and publishers had said they liked it but not enough to go with it uh, but nobody had said they hated it and then when love nina was published and it was genuinely my voice because it was letters I wrote only for my sister and nobody was ever supposed to see them and they were written so long ago I just rewrote Man at the Helm in that voice my voice mm -hmm. and so yeah it was the same story but in my voice which I dared to use wow so, which I think is really nice to tell people because it's a reminder that we should always try our own voice first maybe and it's so hard for people to access it. I mean, it's so surprising. I the, uh, the one writing class I went to was in LA and it was this, this guy named Jack Grapes and it was called Method Writing. So it's kind of like an acting, you know, type thing. Yes. But, but the first job, the first thing that he had everybody do was write how you talk. And nobody could do it. I couldn't believe it. I could do it. And I was like, okay, this is my last class. I never went back to a second one, yes. but I couldn't <laughs> believe it the way that the struggle that people have with just writing the way they talk. Yeah, so yeah. I, I, I write how I talk and you write how you talk. And I, I think we have to just realize that we're lucky that we yeah. are able to write how we talk. Yeah, 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 yeah. A lot well, of I, this, there's, a, there's a writing teacher that I know called Kathy Rensenbrink here in the UK. And she gets people to write letters to different people so that you see how differently your voice is when you write to your sister, your partner, your husband, your boss, an old friend, you know, the man at the grocery store. And she uses letter writing as a way and saying, you know, maybe you're less self-conscious when you write to that person, maybe that version of your voice is good. And I, and I thought that made sense. I was just lucky that my letters got discovered and they were that voice. If, you yes. know, if, if it had been letters to, you know, somebody else, I wouldn't be able to keep it up. But wow. then it was my actual voice to my sister, who I would never be anything other than natural. At Very authentic. natural. Um, yeah. Now, I have, I, I this is so um, selfish, but I'm the one on Zoom. So I, there are so many things in it that I thought were really funny. And I want to ask Good. you, like, wh where did it come from? You know what I mean? Because you'll be like, like, for instance, um, the Ian McCune stuff on page 40, like wh where? OK, so. so Susan, the narrator is called Susan. She is obsessed with Ian McEwen. Oh, she, you know what? Maybe yeah. we can read this. Yeah. Did you have your book available? I, I, I've got a book. Is it page, it's on page 39? It's on at the bottom of 39. Yeah, Susan is obsessed with him. Okay. And I'm just uh, in the middle of 40. From my mother. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my I'm mother. Still, I, okay. Okay. Yeah. Shall I, do, shall I read it? Oh, yeah. So, so this is Susan, the narrator, talking about her mother when she was, a, when she, Susan, was a child. My mother, who had been perfect and adventurous in my early years, had been injured in a railway accident at High Wycombe Station when I was 10 and woke from a short coma having turned nasty and developed a West Country accent. This incident, by the way, is replicated with such bizarre accuracy in the novel On Chesil Beach that I wondered when I read it many years later whether Ian McEwan might know of it or have read the station master's report. As the train moved into the station, a passenger on board opened the door before the train had come fully to a stop. The lady in question was knocked down by the door and found to be unconscious by two alighting passengers. The train steward gave assistance until an ambulance arrived. 
Or McEwen might have been there, seen the whole thing. He might have been the actual man who, in his haste to meet with his editor, opened the door while the train was still moving and knocked her down and then rushed on in a great hurry, looking back briefly before exiting to the Totteridge Road. He'd be the right kind of age and build. I'm not really blaming him. I'm just saying he must have got the idea from somewhere. <laughs> she's obsessed with Ian that. McEwen. She's, she's obsessed with him. And so much so, I mean, it, it crops up, he crops up a few times, yes. as do other writers. And yes, others. I love yeah. it. It's just... Yeah, it's, I, that, that's my favourite bit. Jar. I love the writers. I love the writers' bits. And yes. But Penguin in the UK, my publisher in the UK, they got lawyers to check it that McEwen couldn't come at us and sue us. But how did you come up with that? I know this is like, how would somebody <laughs> have come up with the fact that, that, the, that the mother... <laughs> God, I'm, the way of well, I'm, I'm, and, yeah, yeah. I because I'm a bit obsessed with him myself because he, I was annoyed with him once. I read a book. I've read many of his books, and he's annoyed me a few times, which is not my normal thing with writers. But he did annoy me. There was one book. I think it was a book. I think it might have been called Saturday. It's called One Word Saturday. Saturday or yes, yes. Was it Saturday? Yes. And in Saturday. He has, it's a married couple, happily married couple. And every morning, the what they wake up really early in the morning and the wife rolls over and they have intercourse. Right. And oh, I just this thought, ideal, this totally ridiculous was, ideal. But, yeah, I just thought, thanks a fucking lot, Ian McEwen. Excuse my language, sorry. But that's what I thought. I just thought, thanks, great. You know, oh. that you've made that like a normal morning thing for <laughs> us all. <laughs> And it just irritated me so much. And then a few other things like that. And then in the book, he steals pebbles from this really famous beach that we've got here in the UK yes. uh, called Chesil Beach. He names one of his books on Chesil Beach. And in real life, he used to steal the pebbles, the big, these big pebbles. <laughs> yeah. And it just irritated me. I read it in the paper. He said, oh, I love to steal the pebbles. And I just thought, you can't just go around stealing pebbles. So oh. I'm obsessed with him. It's a slightly. Yeah. I see. I see. That's interesting. That's, That's interesting. where that came from. Now, what about the Pegasus? The the uh, we call them camper. The camper vandalism. Camper van. Mm -hmm. The vandalism. Where it, did you just make that up? I just it? made that up. That's me being a brilliant novelist, Maria. I'll, I'll say. Believe it. That's the only time I've ever been a brilliant novelist. I just thought, <laughs> what could? I, oh, they go camping. Someone will vandalize it. They won't know who did. Yeah. Yeah. What about what about the more writerly references? What about the Mitfords being associated with the college and then the college trying to contact the Mitfords to see if they, they yeah. would well, lend and their name? Course, the most Mitfordy thing that can happen to you is that you contact them and say, we're friends, can you please contact us? And they go, we don't know you. They snub you. To be snubbed oh. by the Mitfords is a most Mitford thing to happen. I made it up. I, all the stuff about writers, Margaret Atwood, who oh, right. else is in there? Oh, Rachel Cusk. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, yeah, That that's fantastic. The, well, he, you know what else I really liked? And it brings me to kind of another topic is the, well, I didn't know this Updike quote. Is this a real Updike quote? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so the Updike the Updike quote is women are empty museums filled with that's men's art. art. That's true. Jesus. Okay. So, so yeah. that's kind of crazy. I didn't yeah. know that. So just for the viewers at home, women are empty museums filled with men's art. And now I saw that you were, you won a woman's comedy award, a yeah. women novel. Is it for novelists or just being a funny woman? Is it for I novels? think it's, it, that one is for novels. Yes, for, for novels, novels. Maybe. Just novels. Okay. So it's a comedy women's prize for writing. And right. my, my last book won it. Yes. But it, it was set up fairly recently by this woman who was just fed up with the, this other prize here in the UK, although it's open to all writers in English, called the, the Woodhouse Prize. You're aware yes. of the Woodhouse Prize. And she worked out that only three women in 50 years, I mean, I, I don't know what the numbers are, right, but something right. like that, three women in 30 years had won it. And she got really cross, so she set up a prize just for women. But then because she was so cross, and it was in all the press that she was cross and she was setting up this prize, 
the the Woodhouse Prize had to then give it to a woman and gave it to me. Oh, <laughs> double win! So I did really well out of it. I did yeah, really so well. You I probably well. wouldn't have won if if she hadn't got really cross with them. Now, what do you think about? Because I get asked this a lot, and I don't have a good answer. So sorry, maybe you also don't. But about what what is it being? A, a female comedy writer. Uh, do you think that women have to be different kind of comedy writers? Are they essentially different from male comedy writers? Or what do you think the issues are about being a woman and being a comedy writer? For me, yeah, yeah. For me, the the issues I have is that mm -hmm. my books are called uh, by male reviewers. Sometimes they're called slight. You right. know, they're seen as very light, very fluffy. They don't realize that a prolapsed uterus is like a big deal, and you know, giving birth and not giving birth the whole thing about how we forge our go forward in life, how we negotiate the world, right. and um, yeah, I, I mean, it, and it makes me really quite cross. I don't mind anyone not liking my book or not thinking it's funny but i do mind when people think it's just fluff because me too. my books no. aren't fluff no and some to me so many men will come up to me and go i actually like your book <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> they're doing me some great favor you know yeah, yeah, yeah. Really i don't like usually i don't usually read women but yeah. you know i i did i, yeah, I was I, like wow so you can you can take that home with you you know yeah. like you yeah, can yeah, now yeah. walk walk higher in the world yeah. for that yeah you know that's true i mean and i think that there was a time in comedy and i'm thinking more maybe like stand-up comedy where i feel like women it felt like they had to mat match men for like grossness or crudeness. Yeah. It was like yeah. kind of a race to the bottom, you know, of like yeah. the men were like, how gross, how much can we talk about what fat masturbating TV watching pigs we are. And then women were like, wait, I'm a fat masturbating <laughs> yeah. TV watching pig too, yeah. you know? So yeah. therefore I'm a female comedian, but I love, I love what you're saying. I do think that it takes a lot more courage to write the kind of, the more honest, small seeming comedy of being a woman, because it's, yeah. Yeah, but it, it's easy I mean, to go big. It's hard to go small. It is. And I mean, for me, I was just saying this to someone the other day that I, the, a real thing that happened to me, I was wait, I was in a cafe waiting for my turn to order some tea. And the woman in front of me got to the counter to order her tea and cake or whatever. And she said, could I have a green tea? and a slice of award-winning fruitcake. And I just thought, that's just brilliant. So I want, I thought, I when I want to, they, I want to now say, could I have a cup of tea and some cake that came third? Right. <laughs> it's just, you know, to me, those little details are funny. I love little And you things. put that in and that's in the- I do put it in and, I, and yeah. then, and then, you know, I get men saying, you know, a slight book and i think no fruit cake is serious yeah prolapsed uteruses is are serious and and but I, I what i don't want to do is make men a huge joke i yes. don't want to i i want to laugh at everybody equally um and i was very i was a little bit concerned that i was getting a little bit too uh unkind to my male characters in this book and I had to tone it down a bit. Well, you you certainly redeemed Roy, I would say. Oh yeah. You redeemed him, but he's a good a good, you know, finding the the books in his in his bureau, yeah. hiding the yeah, horror, yeah. you know, I I felt like he he was definitely redeemed and and he there was wisdom in his is uh like resistance to engagement, let's say, yes. and all the drama. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's wisdom. I mean, I think he comes off, there were a couple points where you, where, where Susan is coming, you know, has a lot of drama going on and he's mm. just has a one or two word answer that actually yeah. is, is the proper two word answer for yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. The defining yeah. two words. Yeah. Agreed. I, I agree with that. But I think, I think some of me, male comedy can get too aggressive or a bit too 
just like there's somebody on the end of the joke and I never want anyone to be on the end of the joke. I, I want us to be, I want to be laughing at all of us. Equally. At everyone. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now we have a couple questions. Deirdre asks, yeah. who is your favorite author and why? Well, Maria Semple, because she's so funny and Patchett and seriously, you and Patchett. Um, I love writers like we've got a writer. Well, she's not with us anymore, but there's a writer in the UK called um, Sue Townsend, who wrote a book called a the, the Diary of Adrian Mole. And she's very funny. I'm writing that um, down. Oh, the diary, you'd love the the diary of Adrian Mole. It okay. was written probably about 30 years ago. And she's, it's this diary of this boy. It's very you, very oh, you. Okay, good. That, I mean, it's, it's of its time. She's, it, she talks about the politics of the day. So it's a little dated now. My children didn't enjoy it very much. So hmm. maybe, um, I love people like Jane Gardham. Do you know her? Oh yes. Yes. Old film. I love her. Yeah. Um, I love. Uh, I love Josh Ferris. I love uh, uh, Woodhouse. Yes. Gosh, but I've been, uh, during the pandemic or like that, I was reading a lot of Woodhouse because it's yeah. just, it really takes very, your mind off things and it's very so cheering. readable and funny. Very funny. Do you know a writer from uh, the UK called Barbara Pym? Oh, of course. Yes. Yeah. Like normal people. No, what, what, no, what is it? Her um, books I think there's one called Prudence and Jane. There's one called Some Tame Gazelle. Okay. Um, yeah. I want to see. Yeah. Yeah. No, she's excellent women. Oh, she's excellent brilliant. Excellent women. Sorry. That's what yeah. I'm thinking. Excellent yeah. women. Excellent like women. She's so a, funny. She's kind of a spinster writer, right? Yeah, she's she's superb. Very, very funny. She wrote yeah. a batch of funny books and then she went a bit bleak and melancholic Oh, and that wasn't quite so much fun. Also, um, Muriel Spark. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. You know what? I'm right now, I'm in the middle of loitering with intent. Oh, yeah. So good. So, so, so good. So good. Yes. Have you oh, read, she's uh, so brilliant. I mean, have I have you I, read A Far Cry from Kensington? No, I've only oh, read um, it's oh, her best. Jean Brody and Women of a Girls yeah. of Slender, Slender Means. Slender Means. Yeah. And now I'm on um on loitering with intent, which yes, is and so, so what's the next one? Well, there's one called a, a Far Cry from Kensington. Okay. I think that's her best. It's very autobiographical. Wow. It's so wow. funny. It's about being in publishing and oh, it's just very, very I don't want to say things okay, that might be. No, she's it. so I mean, good. She's like an it's like an acid trip, those books. She is so inventive. Oh my yeah. god. Uh, that really? woman yeah it's underrated wild. strangely strangely underrated totally underrated yeah. no it, it's yeah. it's it's kind of shocking um yeah. i'm gonna share the screen for the people at home because i want to show uh this would have been five years ago in london with i'm gonna say also one of your favorite writers yeah one of my favorite writers so everybody um this is i met nina uh, for the first time and Barbara Trapito. And I'm showing this because um, I, when I was at Parnassus Books, one of the great compliments of my life, really the crowning glory was, my, where'd you go Bernadette? Was on the shelf with Love Nina and Brother the More Famous Jack. And I thought, oh my gosh, if I'm in the company of Love Nina and Brother the More Famous Jack, I'm done. So we met at the Wallace Collection, right? Yeah. Yeah, and we those did. were and those were books you gave us, and I still have a cute little bag that that you that you gave me. That every time I carry it, I say, "Guess who gave this to me?" Yeah. Um, and so this is Barbara cracking us up because we love her, Barbara. Oh. and it, had you met her before, Nina? Had you ever met her? I had never met her before, but we all three felt the same. We were overwhelmed to be in this sort of trio. Yeah, the and trio. You know, and I had to leave to go to my brother's wedding. That's right. And I didn't want to go to it. I mean, I love my brother and I love his husband, but I didn't want to go because it oh, was because we were it all was there. Wonderful. And then this picture is funny. This is my my uh, my boyfriend like leaning in, trying to get in on the ladies cracking each other up. And he was uh, he was very sweet because he understood how special it was for you yeah. and, for you and me to be with Barbara. That he didn't want to get in there, but he couldn't resist, kind of leaning in, saying, "What are they she saying?" Was, so she was so funny that day. She was a delight. Yeah. I know that was that was that was really wonderful. Um, it's wonderful. Okay, so here's here's another question from Kim. She says, "What is the process or magic 
authors go through to pen their books titles and our titles sacred, like icing on the cake, mm. apologizing for the lame reference. Well, this is an, an, a really wonderful title. One day I shall astonish the world. What's your relationship yeah. with your titles? With my title, I think titles are really important. And one of my books, my middle novel, the, my second one called Paradise Lodge. Yes. It didn't sell as well as the others. And it's a it's a lovely book. I, I you know, I love it. Yes. But it, I just think that it was the wrong title. There's the word paradise just it turns people off. I don't know. And lodge isn't that sexy. No, lodge just and it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> what? And it, it's about um, uh, uh, what I, we call in the UK a nursing home, a geriatric home. Right. And, Another layer of maybe. not. Yeah. And it's just so it was I just think it's my dog's playing around um so i i know um, man at the helm just came to me and it seemed right and that was okay and then paradise lodge referenced a tv show in the uk from many many years ago and i thought oh that would be funny but actually it didn't translate and the book didn't sell that well and then the next book was called reasons to be cheerful and again i sort of think it wasn't i didn't love that title it was an ian jury song from the Oh. late 70s and it i just again i just was never happy with it one day i shall astonish the world the title what came to me so lockdown in in the pandemic had happened i was struggling writing the book and making my poor characters go through the beginning of this and my son who was then i don't know 17 he was supposed to be doing his school exams, but they were all cancelled. His girlfriend came to live with us, which was terrifying because we all had to be on best behaviour. We'd got this <laughs> new visitor in the house and we we were, oh, we're in a pandemic and we know we can't leave the house, but we've got this stranger, lovely, wonderful stranger. And I said to her, I sort of involved her and said, uh what can i call this book and i want the i want the title to be the motto of the university and she came up with it really? Anya, Anya oh my gosh with it. wow she and is I have, she I have, deep. She, i've never had such good feedback about a title ever and it was Anya ostfeld harper who came up with it wow that's fantastic it's really a charming title it's and so it's lovely like isn't it it feels so you and it's not yeah. you it's someone else yeah and it's not me but i see i love where'd you go bernadette there is no better book title oh well i'll tell you it's so funny you say that because um that wasn't the original title and it's just kind of a funny thing that my working title on that was bernadette past and present and the my boyfriend george in that picture yeah. he read it and he said you know, the past isn't exciting and the present isn't exciting. <laughs> you need to be pushing into the future. Like, yeah. like people are not going to see the word past in the title. Yeah, you know, it's that's so clever of him. About reading the book like you want. And so then he's really good at titles, I've got to say. And so my my agent didn't like the title. And before we submitted it, nobody liked the title. And he walks up to the gym and, and he was there, I guess he was in the gym in the steam shower and then came out and wrote this long list of titles. Um, and, and then came up a few with a few more on the walk home. And then, uh, and then just to say like, screw you to my agent, because I just said, I can't think of a title. I just kind of took a picture of that and sent it to her. And she just said, that's the one, like he came up with Brilliant. it, it was one of 30. And, and then, and he doesn't like the title and he's like, don't fucking put that title on me. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so now it's I'm just- brilliant. He should do a service for all authors. He should just go and just write us all down lots of titles and we'll Almost. find them that way. That's right. That's it's funny. hard and titles are important. I mean, I, I, the thing that I'm starting now, I actually don't have a title for it. And it's a little, like you feel a little rudderless in a way. Oh, you, it's like awful. A, Right. Without you, like if you have a title, even though it's not like you're writing towards the title, it just feels a little like you have guardrails on. If you oh, if you, so much. So I agree. It's horrible not having a title. Awful. Yeah. And with this one, I was going to call it oh, something awful. I can't remember even now. It was so bad. And with reasons to be cheerful, I was going to call it the waiting room. Oh, yeah, like, that's not good. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it's a very good question, whoever asked that. That's a yes. great question. That's a fantastic question. Now, mm. our time has come to an end. Oh. Does anyone, I know it's so sad. Does anyone have any other um questions I'll, I'll give I'll give people it's going to be the 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 end of the end of the thing and uh, I'll ask one more question unless unless we have other ones but um uh I'm curious that that you're saying you don't want or, or do you feel like Susan you you want to write more about her or do you or is it Lizzie the one that you still have some unfinished business with I think I think Lizzie I I think I mean if everybody went crazy for this book and they said we can't live without more but I think Lizzie is is the voice I yeah I want to return to. Can, can you pick Can you pick her up after she's written like yeah. Love Nina and do like an auto? I mean it yeah. is kind of all auto fiction, but can you? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you'd even use Love Nina, but I mean you might even be crazy. I'd skip. Love. I'd skip. I'd skip those years. Right, and, and then and, pick up, and then pick up after she's published yeah, it yeah right? yeah i mean i i've got tons of letters i could do a love nina reboot oh i haven't, I haven't got enough to do the whole but i could do a memoir with interspersed letters but i just don't know would people want that i i don't know yes yeah <laughs> big yes you have you've made one sale and i'm speaking for Ann patrick when I <laughs> okay this. so you have two sales um wow that's fantastic that's exciting and so are you enjoying your your book tour um oh, i'm loving sorts. it I, I i can't believe i'm doing this with you and parnassus i this is a, a huge high point for me i haven't said i've been overwhelmed so i've just been smiling but really <laughs> you know everybody's just been going crazy about me speaking to you and with oh. Anne Patchett's bookshop. And this is just a dream for me. I know all authors, it's it just to be associated with Parnassus books. So thank you. Thank you, Parnassus, thank you, Parnassus. Books for having us. Thank you, Elise and RJ and, and, um, and Anne. And it's really fun. And Nina, thank you so much. This was, this was thank wonderful. You. And, well, we and, must um, do it again. We must do it somehow again. I must talk to you again. I know. We we will we will do it again. We will do it again. Okay. Take Thank care, you. everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 <laughs> Nina's book. Yes. One day I shall astonish the world. Okay. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. bye.